M S W Media. News. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. Today, Judge Aileen Cannon signals in a hearing today that she's amenable to delaying Trump's Florida trial. Kosh Patel testified for the defense in the trial to keep Donald Trump off the ballot in Colorado pursuant to the 14th Amendment. The Congressional Budget Office is out with its score on the GOP aid package to Israel. Donald Trump Jr. takes the stand in the New York Attorney General's civil fraud trial. The House will vote Wednesday night on whether to expel George Santos and Tommy Tuberville's hold on military promotions may have contributed to the heart attack suffered by the Commandant of the Marine Corps. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. You know, it has to be 2023, the year of accountability, when uh, Kosh Patel and Don Jr. are going to be testifying on different in different jurisdictions on the same day. I was just thinking about like what John, Don Jr. is and like, is he is he a smug? Like, did he do a big like eight ball before he went in or is he like sober today? Is he smug with the judge? Like, I would love to have a camera in that courtroom just to see what kind of a douchebag he is. Yeah, according to like um, Lisa Rubin from MSNBC and um, Adam Klasfeld from The Messenger, he was pretty smug and got kind of defensive at the end. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and later in the show, I'm going to be chatting with Steve Pearson, my friend of the How We Win pod, about the fund that MSW Media set up to raise money for the opponents of the 18 Republicans in Biden districts, as well as his candidacy for California State Assembly. He's such a cool guy. And I'll be chatting with Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn about his book, which, by the way, just minutes ago, made the New York Times bestsellers list. Yes. That is uh, called Standing My Ground. It's available now. It's really amazing. And I can't wait to speak to him. Just a couple of quick hits. Uh, the House is going to vote tonight on whether to expel George Santos. He, you know, he faces 23 federal felonies and will go on trial in September of next year. <laughs> <laughs> He, he he gave his speech on the floor today about how they're coming after him. And and, and he and by the way, nobody else spoke on his behalf. OK, of course so they he, didn't. he he spoke on his own behalf and said that the, his, you know, GOP Republican House representatives in New York were acting as judge and jury. Uh, and and I was like, no, an actual judge and an actual jury are going to act as judge and jury for you. But uh Chamber needs two thirds to kick him out. I'll be watching that with some popcorn later. And you'll likely know the outcome of that vote by the time this episode airs, but we'll, we can laugh about it tomorrow uh, on the Daily Beans. And there was a hearing in Trump's retention of national defense information and obstruction of justice case in Florida. And Judge Aileen Cannon seemed keen on delaying the trial. Maybe not till after the election, maybe just a couple of months. But as of this recording, we haven't seen a decision out yet. She said she would get to it ASAP. Uh, but it's just like we've been saying over on the Jack podcast. She's not doing anything outright nutty, but she is definitely going to nickel and dime on delay, I think. I think you're probably right. Yeah. So loose cannon. Judge, uh, come on, Eileen, we call her. All right. <laughs> we have we have a lot of news to get to. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. This is from Erica Orden at Politico. Donald Trump's eldest son and co-chief of his business empire, Donald Trump Jr., denied in court Wednesday that he was involved in preparing financial documents that exaggerated his father's net worth. His testimony came in the $250 million civil trial in which both men stand accused of widespread corporate fraud. Now, this, this story leaves this out, but the judge has already determined that fraud occurred. This trial is just to to get the amount of money, disgorgement, they call it. we got to disgorge the money from Trump's tiny hands. Uh, New York Attorney General Tis James has accused a former president and his adult sons uh, and business associates of submitting fraudulent documents that inflated the value of Trump's assets in order to obtain favorable terms from insurers and banks. Quote, I wasn't involved in the compilation of the statement of financial condition. That's what Trump Jr. said in response to the questioning, but it was actually more like, I wasn't involved in the compilation of the statement of financial condition. I, I wasn't involved at all. Were you involved? I wasn't involved. It's kind of more how it came out. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> James's office, who pressed him on a key 2017 financial statement today, uh, and that document said it was prepared in consultation with trustees for his father's revocable trust. 
one of the two of those trustees is Trump Jr. Trump Jr. Um, allowed that he advised the accountants about the value of individual deals he worked on, but said those conversations weren't for the specific purpose of preparing the statements of financial condition. He said, I could have sat there and gone through each of the deals individually, not even knowing that it was for the purpose of this, is what he said of that document. Now, it doesn't mean that I used to put this together. I used that to put this together. I didn't do that. Uh, they did. They did that, he said, referring to the accountants. And that was kind of his MO today. I don't do any of this. I took Econ 101 at Wharton at 20 <laughs> years ago, and I don't remember anything about GAP. I know what it stands for, uh, but, you know. I don't know anything about it. That's why we have accountants. That's why I pay people millions of dollars to do this thing, this stuff for me. It's basically his, he's too dumb to crime. Surprised you didn't think Gap stood for got any pharmaceuticals. Okay. <laughs> got any Adderall, pal? That's what it's for. <laughs> Though the former president has attended the trial a few days in a week since it started at the beginning of October, he wasn't in the courtroom to see his kid testify. During much of his appearance Wednesday, Trump Jr. struck a lighthearted and casual tone, eliciting laughter sometimes. I should have worn makeup, he said, wearing a navy suit and a bubblegum pink tie. Uh, he joked uh, that he should have worn makeup as the photographers took pictures of him sitting at the defense table prior to walking to the witness stand. Now, what the story doesn't really get into um, is that it it did get to him at the end of the day. He's coming back um, on Thursday for more testimony uh, but he, he started to get defensive when the lawyers had him cornered with that trustee thing. He was trying to say he had nothing to do with those condition documents, financial condition documents. But he personally signed letters to Mazar's accounting firm as the trustee when when his father was president and gave up being trustee and put put him in charge and his, and, and Eric as as the trustees. And he became erratic and defensive. And his answer, which was nonsense, was stricken from the record because it made no sense. <laughs> they were like, they just take that. That's a non-responsive. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back tomorrow. And incidentally, that document, by the way, and they left this out of the story, too. The attorney general's office produced that document showing that the former president, Donald Trump, signed back on as a trustee to his business on January 15th, 2021. A week after the insurrection proof that that's proof that he knew he lost the election. That's true. So when the judge urged Don Jr. to slow the speed of his responses, Don Jr. said, I apologize, Your Honor. I moved to Florida, but I kept the New York pace. I just kept the New York pace. It's just weird. I just talk fast. That's all I do. I just, just I don't know why. I added some stuff at the end there. But he's he said, I apologize. I moved to Florida, but I kept the New York pace. Trump Jr., whose testimony is set to resume and on Thursday, as I said, is the first of the three Trump kids who are expected to testify. His brother, Eric, is supposed to take the stand tomorrow. Um, he might, might. Maybe that get, gets pushed to Friday. I'm not quite sure. And Donald is expected to take the stand Monday. And their sister, Ivanka, who was dismissed as a defendant, as we said, she's scheduled to testify November 8th or 9th. She has sought to avoid testifying, by the way, and she has appealed today, the judge's ruling last week, ordering her to do so. So that's what's happening in that trial. Wow. I, I just love it. Every fucking one of them, drag them into the courtroom, pit them up against each other. All right, AG, this one's also from Politico. Seems the Congressional Budget Office dealt a blow to House Republicans' Israel aid bill with a report Tuesday that outlines how the bill would increase the deficit. Ah, Interesting. That never happens under Republicans, does it? Every no, fucking time. No, no. Yep. The nonpartisan <laughs> budget scorekeeper said the bill, which Republicans aimed to offset with spending cuts, would actually increase the federal deficit by $26.8 billion with a B over the next decade. Well, the legislation is set to be a test for, of course, new speaker. I hate gay people. Mike Johnson, uh, he's, he holds on his... <laughs> conference and ability to legislate. Now, this is a quote, only in Washington would you cut spending. Do they call it an increase in the deficit? Johnson said Wednesday, who can't do math, apparently. <laughs> now, the bill would send $14.3 billion to Israel without additional funding for the war in Ukraine that President Joe Biden did request. Johnson's bill aims to pay for the assistance to Israel with $14.5 billion in cuts to IRS, uh -huh, which has struggled with un understaffing. The IRS cuts alone would add $12.5 billion to the deficit, according to CBO. Well, the House bill with IRS cuts and no Ukraine aid will hit a brick wall in the Senate. Of course it will, because it's awful. Democrats and many Republicans in that chamber, they support Ukraine aid. And Democrats aren't interested in slashing the boosted IRS funding that they passed just last year. I fucking told you 
the party that claims to be fiscally smart can't count to 217. And they want to pay $26 billion to send $14 billion to Israel. So, yeah, fiscal conservatives, my ass. Next up, from Joe Gould, a top Senate Democrat said that the Marine Corps Commandant's recent medical emergency may be due in part to the fallout from Senator Tommy Tuberville's hold on top military promotions, which has forced several top officers to hold down multiple jobs. Senate Armed Services Chair Jack Reed leveled the accusation a day after the service disclosed that General Eric Smith, a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was hospitalized Sunday. There was no immediate word of when Smith would be released to return to work. Quote, one of the reasons I think contributed to his condition was he was doing two jobs at once. That's what Reed said in a brief interview. I've read where he was working from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. As a result, if he had, as is normal, an assistant, he could switch off. The New York Times, citing people familiar, said Smith had an apparent heart attack while jogging on Sunday. The service has declined to go into specifics, citing the family's privacy. Reed said Smith's medical emergency underscored the fallacy and the danger of Tuberville's tactic of delaying top military nominees from being confirmed. Tuberville has maintained the blockade over the Pentagon's abortion travel policy, which I helped put there, ensnaring more than 300 generals and admirals at the upper rungs of the armed forces. And, and there was some... Uh, stuff going on on the floor. I know that um, I, I just watched a little bit of a speech from Lindsey Graham holding up a picture of the woman who's supposed to be promoted to, to head the Navy uh, for the Joint Chiefs and, and be, you know, be the top officer in the Navy. And he's like, this, this was not, this policy was not her choice. This policy was none of their choices. And he said, imagine a scenario when the Republicans get into office and want to take away that uh, leave abortion policy. And then Democrats blocked promotion of the military uh, yeah, officers absolutely they would lose their minds so you know this is um and I, I was sitting there watching that and i'm like yeah none of those people that travel policy was not their idea i i i wrote that in an op-ed <laughs> to the washington post <laughs> oh my god it's because you're a patriot my friend that's why i'm just a, i'm just such a pain in the ass i guess Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has the option of holding votes on individual nominees, but that would take months and months and months. And the Wall Street Journal reported Tuesday that Tuberville is asking his colleagues to support an effort to quickly confirm Lieutenant General Christopher Mahoney for the number two position at the Marine Corps. So now he can do two jobs and have a heart attack. Uh, a spokesperson for Tuberville, Stephen Stafford, later confirmed the news. Stafford declined to respond to Reed's comments. And because there's no number two, uh, the number two service is unfilled. Lieutenant General Karsten Heckel, Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration, is serving as Acting Commandant. This means he will continue to run the Marine Corps Combat Development Command while effectively acting as the Assistant Commandant and the Commandant. Okay, three jobs. Goodness. Smith, who's been the Assistant Commandant and serving as Commandant in an acting role, was confirmed for the top job late in September. In a statement released Tuesday afternoon, Heckel said the core thoughts and prayers are with Smith. Uh, in typical Marine fashion, I am the next Marine up. That's what Heckel said. This is what we do, as so many have done before us throughout the history of our Corps. We must continue the march forward on behalf of our fellow Marines and nation, regardless of the situation or the uncertainty that we may face. Unquote. That was what our Commandant wants, he said, and what the citizens of our nation require of each and every one of us. Now, some of Tuberville's Republican colleagues are trying to privately persuade him to refocus his blockade on civilian nominees at the Pentagon rather than the uniformed officials. The group includes Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who reiterated Tuesday he still disagrees with Tuberville's tactics of delaying military picks. I've been among those trying to convince Senator Tuberville to express his opposition some other way by holding people who actually make policy, as opposed to our military heroes who've sworn to stay out of politics. Yeah, like, hold my nomination. I'm not nominated for anything, but hold mine. Senator Mark Kelly, a Senate Armed Services member, said he spoke with Schumer and several Republicans Tuesday in an effort to resolve Tuberville's holds. He said Smith's health was part of those conversations. So this is kind of a thing, um, and uh, as it should be. Quote, we're talking about that we have a commandant who's in the hospital, and we don't have a vice commandant, so the Marine Corps essentially doesn't have any leadership. I mean, when was the last time that happened? Senate Armed Services ranking member Senator Roger Wicker said Tuesday that Smith's illness was part of talks to move forward on nominees. So it's part of the talks. 
it's a factor, and we remain concerned and hopeful for the general, but that that's an individual situation that needs to be resolved while we look at the overall picture. That's what Wicker said. And Blumenthal said Tuesday, in the wake of Smith's hospitalization, uh, he wanted to push his colleagues even more vigorously to break Tuberville's logjam. He also pointed to nine open positions at Central Command, CENTCOM, where there have been attacks on U.S. troops by forces supported by Iran. Like dozens of attacks on U.S. troops. Quote, I'm so angry. Uh, as much as I am saddened that the Marine Corps will be handicapped by the absence of a commandant, potentially, he said, uh, the, the potential as well for an absence in the commandant position just reemphasizes how the Tuberville hold is a desperate threat to our national security. Blumenthal said he has, with colleagues, drafted potential solutions to Schumer, but he declined to discuss the details with reporters. Um, but there's been an increasing interest from Republicans. Quote, we have a plan that we work to a draft, and I'm going to continue to press for the Senate to address some legislation. Maybe it's a rule change. I'm not sure, Dana. But J.D. Vance also said today that he's going to block all DOJ nominations because Trump's been indicted. So now the Republicans hate law enforcement, hate the military, and want to increase the deficit. Good work. Good work, Republicans. Nice work. Yeah. Nice job. Nice job. All right, this last story is from Nick Robertson at The Hill. It seems the former Trump administration aide, Kosh Patel, on Wednesday denied claims that President Trump chose not to call up the National Guard during the January 6th attack or delayed efforts to approve their deployments in testimony he provided in the former president's 14th Amendment case in Colorado. They're trying to keep him from running for president based on that amendment. Now, Patel, who was the chief of staff to acting Defense Secretary Christopher Miller during the January 6th attacks, he argued that it was instead D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser who delayed calls for the National Guard in the days before the riot. And this is a quote. Mayor Bowser wrote a letter herself on approximately January 4th, declining further requests for National Guard services outside of the 346 National Guardsmen already authorized. Again, that was Patel on the stand. Went on to say the authorization came in beforehand. It was relayed to the appropriate officials in D.C. and the Capitol Police. It was declined and we acted when their request finally came in on January 6th. That's what he said. Now, Patel made the argument during the third day of the Colorado 14th Amendment hearings over whether Trump can be removed from the 2024 presidential ballot due to his involvement in the January 6th attacks. He said that Trump had authorized the deployment of 10,000 to 20,000 National Guard troops to support law enforcement in multiple meetings he witnessed. Mm -hmm. But the claim contradicts findings from the Department of Defense published nearly two years after January 6th, which states that Trump never ordered troop deployments. I happen to believe that. <laughs> account. Then this is a quote, President Trump had authority and responsibility to direct deployment of the National Guard in the District of Columbia, but never gave any order to deploy the National Guard on January 6th or any other day. And this is from the Pentagon. That's what the report read and went on to say, nor did he instruct any federal law enforcement agency to assist. Hmm. While Patel's testimony also goes against findings by the House January 6th committee, where Miller testified that an order to prepare at least 10,000 National Guard troops was never made. Patel was the first witness called by the defense in Colorado case led by attorneys for the Trump campaign. Now, Patel currently works as an advisor for the former president for national security issues and as a board member for Trump's media company. Well, missing from this story, Patel said that on the stand, he gets paid $15,000 per month by the Trump Save America PAC. Ah, yes. The uh, the good old slush fund that pays to keep witnesses in line, <laughs> apparently. Yep. Yeah, and that also contradicts Patel's testimony to the January 6th um, select committee, by the way. He, he also testified that there was no Trump didn't order the troops out. It, it is bizarre that he would lie on this. But I mean, you know, if he says, oh, I witnessed it in meetings, there's really not a way to disprove that. I mean, except for the, that's true. You know, the Pentagon report. So, I mean, it, it, his own testimony, uh, the testimony of Miller. I don't know. Right. Except for when he said he didn't uh, witness it in meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to be right back with Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn, followed by my conversation with Steve Pearson. And then, of course, we'll have the good news. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm honored to be joined today. I'm honored to be the first person to interview this man since he became a New York Times bestselling author. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Author of the book Standing My Ground. Please welcome Harry Dunn. Hey, Harry, how's it going? Hey, hey G, it's so good to be on with you. And uh, man, you, I'm so freaking I'm still over the moon. You know, um, I uh, that's what, one of the reasons I'm a little late getting to the show. I had to 
make sure I had some bourbon to celebrate this uh, hell of an accomplishment. I was wondering so, what bottle uh, you were going to be picking up on the way home. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Uncle Nearest Single Barrel. So it's a toast oh. to, you know, uh, so good. I, ah. That's the good stuff right there. That's it. That's it. It's not the JMO 15 or JMO 12. JMO 12 or 15? Uh, 18. 18, 18, that's, 18. Even that's better. That's what I sip okay. with you over at um, when we hang out. That's at Shelly's. <laughs> we were at Shelly's. That's right. When we hang out and I'm in town. We got to do it again soon. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be out there for some trial or some shit, I'm sure, pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but man, just congratulations. It was so well earned. I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff in this book because it's truly, truly an incredible book. So well written, so easy to read, my friend, and it's just so well put together. Thank you. You open the book. Uh, with the need to discuss our trauma, you you acknowledge the collective trauma of the country. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, you know, when you talk about January 6th and the victims of that day, a lot of people just talk about the violence that the police officers endured, um, some to the point where they can no longer do their job anymore. But um, I view it, January 6th was an attack on an institution, an attack on this country, um, you know, democracy, every, you know, there's so many different saying about democracy, preserve it, it is fragile and all this stuff. But that's literally what their goal was to topple it that day. Because the top democracy was at the, the seat of a free and fair elections. And they were trying to overturn the election, um, which is kind of like a, a, a cornerstone of democracy. And it was an attack on Americans. And, you know, I, people, whether you were watching it on your iPad in, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas, or you were a block away from the Capitol and uh, for North Capitol Street, you you felt something in your soul and your spirit that this ain't right. And we're still living with the remnants of January 6th now. It's still ongoing. So people are wondering, how do we process all this, this hate, this divisiveness that's going on in this world? Because January 6th wasn't the end of it. Um, it was, I think, the culmination of uh, a lot of things, but it's still continuing. So so it's all of us. It's our collective trauma because we're all in this together. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. I, I remember when I was watching it, it, it was, I had physiological uh, impacts on me. I was nauseous and I felt b like violated on behalf of democracy um it it was yeah. tough to watch um it's like that feeling of if your house has been robbed or if somebody's violated your personal space um it's it's that it's interesting that you say that and glad you say that because you know talking about your, and that's one of the things where i give kudos to the officers that i serve with and even myself even and the the staff the the, the capitol building that building now, which was this pinnacle of democracy, and it's just this symbol of the Capitol building. I mean, it was a it was a, the target of 9-11. Uh, the, the plane that didn't make it was headed for the Capitol. So it's, it's symbolic, and it's still standing, but we were going to work in literally a crime scene. You know, like, just say you get your house broken into or... You know, a loved one dies in your house. You can leave that house. Most people are probably going to move and go to another house, but not here. We still in that. We go to work every single day in a crime scene, and it's. But what also it represents, it represents the good of this the the American people, which can't get lost in this because we got to have a little bit of hope because that's what keeps us getting up in the morning and fight, living to fight another day. Yeah, hope hope definitely begets hope. Uh, I think it's a, a very important yeah. concept. Um, also, I wanted to talk about something that you mentioned in Chapter 5, which is called The Day After. And you yeah. talk about the two sentiments that you heard expressed, um, that that even some diehard Trump supporters on the force were in shock and disbelief and disgusted, but others who were asking, was it really all that bad? And you said that the first sentiment, quote, did little to dampen my rising rage at those who expressed the second. Talk a little bit ab about that, that anger, that feeling. You know, immediately after, it was so difficult to process how you're feeling because one, you can't believe what had happened just happened. And now you're going to go to work with possibly some people, not even necessarily coworkers, but people who work in that building 
who support the president at the time, you know, to support President Trump. And me, I held him from that day of January 6th immediately responsible for what happened. And be because the individuals who were there that day, the reason I feel so confident placing the blame on the former president is because the individuals who were there that day told us that they were there because Donald Trump told him, Donald Trump invited us. We're here for Donald Trump. They those those were their words. So this is not some hypothesis about why I think they were there. No, that was a defense for a great many January sixth riots. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So I immediately and always put the blame on him. Now the individuals, they obviously they acted in their own account, and you know they're responsible for their own actions. But as far as like. The pe I don't understand. I, I never, never was a fan of the former president, even before January. She never was a fan of him. And so I always had a little bit of resentment. But I don't understand how people could still question what they saw. Like, you literally saw officers being eye gouged and beat and there's video of Michael Fanon being dragged into the crowd with a taser driven into this video footage. Or of Danny it. being and crushed in the door. To, and that, yeah, exactly. And people would have the nerve to say, is it really that bad? And that just infuriated the hell out of me. And it's, it's, it's disrespectful. It's willful ignorance. Like I can understand somebody not knowing, but when there's like, indisputable footage of stuff. I don't, I don't get it, man. I don't get it. Yeah. It has to just be infuriating. Uh, and, and something yeah. that just kind of probably just has to be dealt with on a, on a day by day basis. Yeah. Cause you don't want to give it too much of your energy. Right. Cause it's like, I'm not going to argue with dummies that energy. It, it makes you still makes you mad, but you don't give it as much energy as you normally would having a discussion with somebody who would be open to seeing things a different way. So yeah, and it and it forever changed a lot of people. Um, you know, in chapter seven, first of all, you open with a dictionary definition of insurrection. Thank you for doing that. But you also talk about how MAGA Republicans are not patriots, which I think is very important. But at the end, you describe how you lost, quote unquote, a fellow officer, Christine, and not to death or injury, but to what you what uh, she is quoted as a resigned bitterness of that betrayal. That was a really heavy moment uh, for me in this book. I was hoping you could talk a little yeah. bit about that. One thing about that, I, I obviously I'm a face that's associated with January 6th. I'm a face, I'm a voice, and people know my story. But I'm just one individual of many that heroes and sheroes that day. So I wanted to use my book. To, I, from the jump, I was begging officers to come forward and tell their stories. And for whatever reason, they they chose not to. And I respect them their decisions, whatever. But some people wanted their story told, but didn't want them being on the, you know, the. so I would happily interviewed one of my coworkers that we call Christine in the book. And like her, so many people, the job used to be fun. We used to enjoy it. We have this bitterness now about us. It's just now you ask, if you ask 10 people, officers at work, how they're doing, Nine of them will tell you, I'm here. I'm here. I, I'm here. I'm not good. I, I'm here. And we're counting down the days until you don't have to be here anymore. Because I don't necessarily know if it's all January 6th or everything that stemmed from it. It's... It, it, until you find the bigger picture, like I, I have been fortunate enough to do, that why I still do the job, because I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to be there. But I had to find a bigger picture, something bigger than myself. Um, but everybody has that sense of bitterness. Not everybody, but a lot of people are resigned to that bitterness that they have. And it's it's not enjoyable anymore. And the real victims of that day, they took away what we enjoyed doing as a profession. And now we're just doing it until we don't have to do it anymore. So it's it's unfortunate. Yeah. And I mean, that's your dedication, right? Right in the beginning. You say, uh, I'm one of yeah. the few recognizable faces and voices from January 6th. I dedicate this book 
To the men and women who answered the inconceivable call of duty and public service that day, whose voices, faces, and names you may never know. That's Correct. right there in the beginning. And you're that's the dedication. The dedication. Those men and women, like I said. And I I'll put use this opportunity to push back a little bit because people, the naysayers that I don't pay much attention to, said I made this all about me. And every moment I get, I praise my coworkers. You know, I, I'm I'm so happy to work with the the professional group of men and women that I do work with. And, um, you know, I, I, their, their stories deserve to be heard just as loud as mine does. Those haters are weird, man. Everybody's story is about them. And that's what makes our lived experience part of storytelling. Exactly. exactly. Hello. <laughs> like, I, I think maybe they're just jealous that they don't have a story. I, you're like, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's, it's odd when people, when people get that way. Finally, I want to talk to you yeah. a little bit about uh, about the justice and the accountability. You testified to the January 6th Select Committee. I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, up there with your fellow officers, and, and you used the hitman analogy. You said you don't just arrest the hitman. You you arrest the guy who sent him. And, uh, you know, now we've got, um, we've got four felony counts related to this, uh, including um, conspiracy against rights to take away our right to yeah. vote and have our vote counted. Then, of course, the obstructing an official proceeding, what they did that day at the Capitol. All of it is wrapped up in, in these four criminal counts, felonies in, in D.C. Um, the trial is set to go uh, in in March. Um, how are you feeling about the justice? Because I, from my personal point of view, in my own personal life with, you know, I never got justice for what happened to me when I was in the military. Uh, I yeah. kind of get justice by proxy through other people going to prison, <laughs> yeah. but, yeah. um, you know, for, for those kinds of crimes, but sometimes, I, you know, most of the people I talk to, they kind of get left feeling like it's just never enough. What, yeah. what are your thoughts? One of the hardest parts about writing the book was I didn't know how to end it. And, you know, which you got an editor and everything. Hey, you got to time. Let's wrap it up. I need, I need a product. And the product wasn't, I wanted to be able to, at the, in the book, to be able to say that Donald Trump is guilty and, you know, happily ever after. But at the time, I wasn't feeling too confident. Like, I had the manuscript done before Jack Smith announced his charges and everything. So we were going on 800-plus days waiting for an investigation. Like, you know, because the Justice Department moves methodically. They don't announce their moves and everything like that. So to my knowledge... It was just a, a hypothetical. Yeah, they're investigating him, but to the officially, nobody knew. Nobody knew. So, eight hundred days later, we're still wondering: like, is anything going to come of this dude? So, it was really frustrating. So, when you talk about accountability, it's you know, right now we're 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 on the path to it, and you know, all signs like, but then again, you know, you got to be. All signs are pointing to he's going to be held accountable. Um, that's what all signs are pointing to. But until it happens, um, I don't know. I, I Now it's just sit back and wait. I have done all that I can do as a police officer, as a citizen, as a person who loves his country to try to bring forth accountability and awareness. I've done everything that I can do. So all I can do now is sit back and wait and hope everybody else is doing all that they can do. I have faith that they are and they will, um, but it's kind of like one of them things like until you actually have it in your hand, it, like I I'll believe it when it's in my hand or, you know, it, hey, like I got you a book or I got you. Okay, I hear you, but until it's in my hand, I'm going to hold out a little bit of hope. Anything could happen. It could, yeah, you could you could have mailed it and the, the, the mail truck flipped over and it fell out the truck. Who knows? Anything. But well, yeah, anything could happen. He's got this he's got this um, novel legal theory that he's got complete immunity that might go up to the Supreme Court. We don't know how long that could take. So I know. Uh, exactly. So it's I believe it's on the way. But until it happens, it's kind of like. What do, why are we why are we still waiting? It's kind of like just a waiting game now. I hate it. Yeah, always is. Always is a waiting game. Well, I am very proud to be the first person to interview you as a New York Times bestselling author. Yes, yes, I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, thank Cheers you. Cheers to you, uh, my yes. friend. I'm also very proud that you're my friend, um, and you too. I'm very, very glad that I know you. Um, even though I almost got kicked out of the courthouse that morning. <laughs> that was crazy, dude. Like <laughs> 
<laughs> ma'am, ma'am. That was crazy. <laughs> and, yeah, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> You're like, I don't know her. I don't know her. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's so funny. And I'm like, can I go sit with my friend? They're like, ma'am, you just stay right where you are. Okay. Yeah, yeah don't move. Just stay right there. <laughs> And then the person was like, AG is the... I was like, oh, gosh, what did she do? Like, <laughs> I have my phone out. I have my phone. And you just... I was like, very no, strict. No. I had no idea how strict they were going to be. But yeah. anyway, congratulations, my friend. And thank you for coming on and speaking to us. I hope I get to see you soon. I hope you travel out to the best coast. Or, you know, you know I'll be in D.C. at some point. Yeah, you know, th- th- thank you. But I-, I wish that I had the opportunity to do, like, a real book tour, like... People do books and they go out on tour for like months and stuff. I go back to work. Like I still work in this job, you know. I even like Sar- even Sergeant Gunnell, who has a book coming out, um, I think in two or three weeks. But uh he's like got events scheduled in California and Florida. And I'm like, dude, I got he asking me, can I come with I gotta work, dude? Like, <laughs> so but but and that makes me that makes this accomplishment even more um to me because I it, it, man, I'm just so I'm so thankful and grateful that people care about what I have to say and what I have to say. So uh, thank you to your listeners, too. Y'all, y'all are the best. So thanks. Yeah. And if you do any book talks, you know, I host book talks for C-SPAN Book TV. I'm very good. So yeah. if you need a if you need a book talk host, you just let me know. I'll be there. Absolutely. I'll be there in Absolutely. a minute, my friend. Yes, indeed. Anything for you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, and stick around because we have another interview with Steve Pearson right after this quick break. Harry Dunn, my friend, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, AG. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We kind of have a, a twofer today because it's sort of a, you know, keep it blue segment, but also a little bit of extra fundraising. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be joined by my friend, host of the How We Win podcast and candidate for Assembly District 44 in California for the California Assembly. Please welcome Steve Pearson. Hey. Hey, Allison. How are you? It's great to see you, my friend. It is really good to see you. And, you know, as soon as I had the idea... I want to raise money for the 18 Republicans who are in Biden districts that just voted for Mike Johnson to be speaker. I was like, you know who can help me? I'm sure he's not busy. (laughs) (laughs) Steve Pearson. And so uh, I texted you and gosh, within a day, you had a a link for me and, and set set the whole thing up. And I, you know, I did a soft launch over the weekend. And I think we're I think we just hit the $60,000 mark, my friend. It's a crazy soft launch. And, um, you know, uh, special thanks also to our friends at Swing Left who make actually setting this up super, super easy. So uh, if any of your listeners want to do your own personal fundraising page, you can go there and do that, too. But why? Why do that when you've got the How We Win Fund all set up and ready for you to go? What makes that fund so cool is, that, yes, it's targeting those uh, Biden 18, but it's also um, strategic in that people come in and out of that fund based on where the greatest need is. Um, and the political department at Swing Left stays in close contact with all the campaigns and knows where folks, uh, you know, money is going to make the biggest impact. So, um, you know, that that's what we loved about the How We Win Fund that we launched for the midterms. We did a really good job with that, raising almost uh, $250,000. And like you said, the soft launch has hit about 65000 already. So I think <laughs> we're going to do... I mean, and that's off of the strength of of you and your incredible listeners who just jumped all over this and knew that we had to, you know, make a stand for the very future of our of our country and our democracy. So thank you to everyone who's already donated, first of all. Yeah. And and I'm assuming sometime next year we'll also just open that fund, you know, wide open for the for the, the house at large to get all the dollars to exactly where they need to go in the districts. Where I, and the 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 way that they work the math out is so incredible. It it really truly gives you the most bang for your buck. So many times people are like, "Where is my money going to do the most good?" Swing Left tabulates that for you, and a hundred percent of your donation goes to the candidates. There's not like a you know MSW Media is not taking twenty percent off the top and <laughs> or anything like that, right? It's a hundred percent of your donation goes. And so I absolutely love that about Swing Left. They're truly an incredible organization. And yeah, we definitely owe them uh, a lot of thanks. And, you know, I, I really, I love the fact that 
they're always they just they're always there for us. And I know that they're going to kick off a bunch of stuff for 2024. What what kind of things do they have in store? Well, they're they're going to announce their 2024 plans in January, so they're getting all that together right now. But uh, the other thing that I'll say about this fund and basically how you know when we I, I used to work for Swing Left, as as you know, and some of your listeners right might remember, and. Um, you know, when we uh, first launched Swing Left, one of the cool things that we did was gave people the ability to engage in these swing district races before we actually have a candidate, you know, because in some cases they're still going through a primary and then you try to guess which candidate should I support and you want to make sure that you're supporting the candidate that the people in those districts choose that we're not, you know, weighing in outside of those districts. So, um, so Swing Left set up what's called district funds and some of those are included in the How We Win uh, 2024 fund. And that just gets held in an escrow until the uh, the winner of the primary is announced, and then that check goes right to that cam- campaign, and 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 they need it because anyone who goes through, believe me, I know anyone who goes through a primary knows that you spend a lot of money in that primary race, and then you hit the general uh, against that Republican candidate, and you really need that money. So um, being able to raise money early is is really key. Yeah. And something else um, we're going to do over here at MSW Media is I'm going to make an advertisement for this fund. And then we're going to donate ad space, ad inventory uh, across the network so that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this, so that's a kind of like a, a donation from from MSW Media to to these folks as well. And so you know what I'm going to say, you know what I want. to What are you going to do? I, I would what I want you to do what we should do is another live show Come <laughs> on, right we got to get back out on the road <laughs> yeah totally I'm I'm, t- I'm looking at next summer I'm booking some dates so I'll, I'll definitely keep you posted and we'll have you we'll have you come out to those maybe we can have some swing left folks join us as well I think that would be um, very wonderful because again I absolutely love what they do over there all right so tell me about your race how's that going how's how are you feeling about uh I remember answering the phone on a street in New York. I think I was on Avenue of the Americas. It was raining. It was nighttime. And you called me up and said, I think I'm going to run. And I said, hell yeah, my friend. So how's that going? It's going great. You know, as a first time candidate, a long time person encouraging everyone else to run for office when they have the opportunity, you know, uh, the support has been really affirming. Um, You know, uh, we measure a lot of our progress in fundraising, right, because uh, um, it's really important. Uh, it's, It's hard, as we just talked about, to reach voters if we don't have the dollars to do it. Um, so I'm, I'm proud to say we're the top fundraiser in our race. We have double the individual contributions of any other candidate in our race. Um, and that, you know, comes from a lot of the folks probably listening to this show um, up and down California and all over the country who, you know, know how important it is to uh, have the persistence, have the resistance representing us in Sacramento. And, you know, who we have representing us really matters. And, uh, you know, Everyone uh, makes an impact no matter where you are, but California is the fourth largest economy in the world, and we really do have an outside impact on the rest of the country. In fact, <laughs> especially well, yeah, right now. If the the for example emissions standards yeah. are are much higher than are required because California demands it, and we buy most of the automobiles in the country, and there's a million examples like that. We transform the automobile industry with our electric car mandate by 2035. All new car sales in California will be electric. We just transformed how corporations do business with new legislation that uh, that requires them to calculate their uh, carbon impact. And, you know, of course, again, we're the fourth largest economy in the world. So anyone who wants to do business in California is doing business worldwide. Uh, and that goes farther than the federal government and what they've been able to do. And so I really believe it's it's an incredibly impactful position and uh, and one that I'm honored to take on. It's my home where I've lived for 30 years. And uh, since I last spoke with you, uh, the teachers are behind us now. We just got endorsed by the California Teachers Association, which excellent, which just uh, you know is so humbling and it's such a huge honor because uh, as we know, 
you know, this is where the culture wars are happening right now, uh, sadly, is in our classrooms with uh, the attacks on the LGBTQ plus communities, with the attacks on curriculum and banning books. And, and we see it all over the country. And we've been seeing it here in California, right here in, in my district in Los Angeles, too. So. L.A., Glendale. I just had Dallas McLaughlin on yesterday from Temecula Valley, and they're doing a trying to do a recall down there gathering signatures for these three uh, Christian nationalists who have taken over the school board, hired their own personal attorneys at the cost of the taxpayer, try, fired the superintendent who was beloved and been, like spent a bunch of taxpayer money to buy out her contract. And they, they, they've they banned CRT. And yeah. now they're doing this uh, parental reporting thing. Yeah, for the fourth outing policy, which is so damaging um, and and really horrific and literally puts kids lives at risk. And, um, you know, uh, teachers are always under resourced. They're never paid enough. But now they're really, um, you know, we have a mental health crisis happening right now. And uh, and teachers need all the support that they can get. And uh, again, I keep saying it with the fourth largest economy in the world. You know, we we can do better by our teachers. And um, so I'm proud to have their support. And um, and also, you know, uh, <laughs> this is the front lines of, of the fight against fascism. I mean, the Republicans have been attacking education forever because they don't want, you know, an informed electorate. Uh, it's that simple. You know, that suits them. And uh, and now we're seeing it. in the yeah, ugly And they want to out our kids and. I mean, it's a dox and attack and threaten. It's it's frightening. Yeah, it's it's terrifying. And, and I have to admit, you know, here in my double blue bubble, I live in like the Studio City area of Los Angeles. Uh, I didn't think it was going to come to to my district. I, I saw it in other parts of, of the country. And um, uh, when I saw the ugliness at Satakoy Elementary School right up the road here, and like you mentioned, what's happening in Glendale Unified School District and all over the place, uh, you know, it brings it very close home to home. And we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, we do. And I'm glad I'm glad you're running and, and uh, tell everybody where they can uh, find and support you. They they know where they can donate to the Biden 18, right? It's in my it's in my pin tweet on Twitter. Uh, it is uh, swingleft.org slash fundraise slash how we win 2024. But how do people support you, my friend? Yeah, I mean, it seems counterintuitive to launch a big fundraiser for everyone else and not include myself, but it's, the stakes are so high. I mean, we have to do it, right? You know, but uh, I would be honored to have uh, everyone support too. You can go to pearsonforcalifornia.com. That's P I E R S O N. F O R C A dot com and join uh, Dolores Huerta and Barbara Boxer <laughs> and Women's March Los Angeles and, uh, you know, join the persistence. Help us out. Uh, we have the ability to really make some big change for folks here in California, and I could use your help to do it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, my friend, for helping me set this up with Swing Left. And, and thank you for everything that you're doing and that I believe you will be doing for the constituents of the 44th Assembly District in Los Angeles. So thank exciting. you. Thank you to all of your listeners. Soft launch hitting $65,000. That's incredible. Keep it going, everybody. I'm really grateful. Awesome. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, you want to play What the Mutt or Find the Cat, or I think somebody wrote it. I actually had a, a friend remind me that we call that Cat Me If You Can, which I like. Oh, my God. That's funny. <laughs> and then uh, I can I guess we can guess the breeds of whatever animal you send to us. We'll, we'll do our best. Um, I'm really good about horses, but that's it, That's about it. <laughs> and if you have a purebred dog, we're pretty good at those, Dana. <laughs> and remember, we have the new game. What the hell is in that show? Guess the turtle. <laughs> what the hell is in that show? <laughs> oh, it's so just funny. my favorite. Okay. That's such a good joke. Um, and then, you know, if you have a shout out to yourself or a loved one or shit kids say or shit you say or a small business or your business. Um, if you want to tell me your uh, theses and uh, dissertation titles, those are fun. Um, anything you want to send to us at all, you can do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. 
First up from Stacy, no pronouns, a little late, but here's a pick of our pumpkin for Halloween. Vote blue and go ahead and say it. Lock him up. Thanks for everything. And it's Trump made out of prison bars. And it's that's lock awesome. him with an up arrow. That's fantastic. I'll grab this next one, too. From anonymous, pronouns he and him. Dana's back. Dana's back. Now that's good news. In celebration, Aww. here's a picture of Lovey, who brought lots of joy to my life. She was born in Albuquerque and loved visits to the UNM Duck Pond. Aww. I, too, love visits to the UNM Duck Pond. If you've never been on the University of New Mexico campus, it's, it's actually quite beautiful. It's where my, that's my alma mater. Oh, yeah. And thank you, Anonymous, for being happy that I'm back. I'm also happy that I'm back. Mm, me, too. All right. And that little pup is adorbs. All right, this is Julie from York, PA, pronouns she and her. This is a shout out to my friend Tracy Shaw, who was board chair of the SCORE Association. SCORE is a resource partner for the Small Business Administration and provides free mentoring and education to owners of startup and new businesses through a network of 11,000 volunteers. Tracy's great to work with on the board, but this shout out is for her recent graduation as a PhD. Her doctoral thesis title, ooh, ooh. Social Capital Impact on the Growth of Women-Owned Healthcare Small Businesses in the United States. Fuck yeah, that's great. Nice. I want to read that. I know, right? For pet tax, I've included Zelda and Augie, my canine besties. Zelda's eight and a mini Labradoodle. I love Labradoodles. And Augie, black and white, is two years old. Uh, Havanese lover boy. Now they bark hello to every neighbor who walks by and like to chase chipmunks up the downspouts. Oh my gosh. They're Look awfully at cute. Zelda and Augie. Oh my god. They're really cute. Mini Labradoodle. How adorbs. And this little baby pumpkin Havanese is so cute. Thank you for that submission. Next up from Chicagoland Dad, pronouns he and him. Hello, Laguma Naughty. Mm-hmm. N A U G H T Y. I want to give a shout out to all the kids out there in this crazy world. It's Halloween, and let's all show the kids some community and love today. My oldest kiddo in pre K sat me down this weekend so I could write a letter to her friend who's moving away to Mexico this weekend. My eyeballs swept profusely as I dutifully wrote her words in purple crayon on her blue construction paper. I have no address to send this to, so I'm sending this letter out to the universe to remind everyone that these kids are all right. Here's the letter without an address from my five-year-old. Dear friend, I'm worried about you. I do not want you to get hurt. I'm sad you won't come to my birthday parties anymore. I hope we can have a play date one day. I love you, friend. Aww. No. If, if my daughter's friend hears this someday, I can assure you there are lots of heart stickers and dinosaur tattoos that she picked out just for you, taped on, so they wouldn't get lost in the mail. The kids are all right, but they've been through a hell of a lot with COVID, lockdown drills, and all the traumas that do or don't make it into our news feeds. Let's keep everyone safe out there this Halloween. That's a great submission. Thanks, Chicagoland Dad. Oh, it's very, very sweet. Yeah. All right. This one's from Bean, pronouns she and her. Happy Halloween, AG and DG. I'm following up, as promised, with a photo of my dog. 89, dressed as weird Barbie, arguably the best Barbie. Uh, Yeah, it is in front of her architecturally compelled weird Barbie house for Halloween 2023. This past weekend, we happily participated in the Washington Square Park Halloween dog parade and contest in New York City and were recognized with the coveted honorable mention prize. It was an incredible day filled with crowds of creatives and dog lovers celebrating the season. Just to interrupt, AG, I just saw this. Carson Kressley, I'm almost 100 percent sure was there. And I was like, look at all these dogs and costumes and all these people with their dogs and now the submission comes in because i was like where are they now i know that's amazing and and what a cool group of people right dog lovers that love halloween i know (laughs) sign me up all right i agree well uh to do with all the atrocities going on in the world it's been nice to have this delightful exercise to work on and this event to look forward to but it's been difficult to justify the frivolity while tragedies continue to unfold here at home and around the world i remind myself throughout that sometimes joy is a revolutionary act in the face of despair well said bean I was particularly enamored with this quote from the movie delivered by the incomparable Kate McKinnon as Weird Barbie. 
and I quote, you can go back to your regular life or you can know the truth about the universe. The choice is now yours. I hope that your listeners and everyone who sees the Barbie movie take the sentiment to heart and continue to be engaged members of society, standing up for what they believe to be right and just in the world. We cannot allow hateful individuals with the loudest voices and the most media coverage to drown out the messages from those advocating for peace and equality. Again, Bean, well said. Thank you for all you do to ensure that people remain consistently informed of the what is usually bad news and always followed up with redemptive good news to leave us on. You, your guests, and your listener submissions consistently remind me that the cohort of good-hearted citizens surely outnumbers the fascists, and if we stay vigilant and stick together, we will prevail. To see 89 as Weird Barbie, uh, Bark Obama, and other fab costumes, check out at dognamed89 on the Instagram. Stay weird. Oh my God, so good. This is so good. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) fantastic costume so good weird barbie is the best barbie i i i personally agree with that sentiment look she's got little pink in her hair it's this is adorable it really is absolutely great and i love that quote my other favorite quote is um Rhea Perlman as Ruth when she says, uh, mothers us we mothers we stand still so our daughters can look back and see how far they've come that's really, it's hard for me to get through that sentence without tearing up. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a good one. But, uh, if you fantastic. haven't seen the Barbie movie and you're like, I'm not going to see a movie about Barbies or I've heard bad things about it, blah, blah, blah. Everyone has opinion on everything. And I'm telling you, even though you don't have to listen to my opinion, the movie's really fucking good. And I tell you right now, between Barbie, Beyonce and Taylor Swift, this is a massive feminist movement happening in our world right now that is so subtle in some ways and so out there in others. They have literally shifted our economy. I mean, it's fucking mind blowing. What these three women, and I'm sure there are thousands of others around doing, but we're having a shift right now in the energy of our of our country. And th- those three things, just those three things together, I'm telling you they're going to be talking about that in women's like studies classes for years to come. This moment in time, yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't laughed out loud that, that oh, and hard pink. at a movie. Yep. That's the, that's in, the fourth one, solo. pink. Pink is amazing as well. Yeah. But yeah, some but some guy put, uh, posted on Twitter um, that Kansas City lost because because Taylor Swift wasn't at the game. <laughs> and and I I replied, is she out for the season? <laughs> oh my god, that's funny. I you got it was jokes. A pretty good joke. I got jokes. One. You got jokes. I got jokes. All right, next up from Gail P. Pronoun she and her. The last of the bins of apples were hauled away the other day. Today, the orchard was quiet. No tractors, no trucks, no ladders clanging, no hardworking, amazing workers diligently and good naturedly going up and down the ladders all day, delivering 40 pounds of apples each time to gently roll them into the bins. The old forklift sits waiting to be put away for the winter. And just like that, the trees began to turn to let go of their leaves and prepare for winter. Their job done for another season. Be thankful for these people who bring food to your table and who, in one day of very hard work, make what some CEOs make in a nanosecond of sitting at their desk. This is a tribute to them. Eat an apple a day and be kind to the people who make it possible. Thanks also to AG and DG for their hard work and for all of us who care about our democracy. That is a fantastic submission. Yeah, it is. Thank you for that. Gail, I love this. It's poetic. It's beautiful. It's got a great message. It's got a good arc. I love this. I love this submission. Our beans have good hearts. They really do, you know? Yeah, we got it. We got some good hearted really beans do. out there. Tons and tons. And we all have each other's backs. That's such a good feeling. It really is. It's a really good I feeling. Agree. Thank you, everybody. Please send us your good news or anything you want to write about. Send it in to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Thanks so much to Officer Harry Dunn and congratulations on becoming a New York Times bestselling author. And thanks yes. to Steve Pearson for helping me set up the fund to raise all that money. And thanks to all of you for donating to it. And I also want to thank him for running for office. We need folks like him in our state assembly. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here today, Dana? Just another quick reminder, if you're in Ohio, please get out and vote on Tuesday. Vote yes on initiative ballot, the ballot initiative one. You could actually change the constitution in the state of Ohio 
if you have more access to abortion. This is a big deal. And you know that if this goes through, it's going to have a butterfly effect across the entire country. So go out and vote. Take someone with you. And I'll say it again in a moment right after AG says this. (laughs) Yes on one and vote in Virginia. Everybody until tomorrow, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your family. Vote blue over Q. And take everyone you know with you. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>